Good evening and welcome to Hudson Valley Week in Review, where we look back at the people, places and issues making news in Ulster County and the region. I'm Amy Green. We begin tonight with the honoring of a former Tuskegee Airman who just received a very fitting memorial. Benjamin O. Davis was the only black cadet at West Point from 1932 to 1936 and was shunned during his time there, calling himself at one point, quote, an invisible man. Now the military academy has named a barracks after him nearly a decade since his death. Davis had a long and impressive resume commanding the infamous Red Tails Fighter Group, followed by becoming the first black general for the Air Force. He was a three-star general when he retired in 1970, but was honored with a fourth star by President Bill Clinton back in 1998. West Point officials saying the dedication is fitting, a wrong made long ago, now set right. He joins people like Eisenhower and MacArthur, who also have buildings named after them at West Point. RNN senior political producer Karen McBride recently visited West Point to learn more. She spoke with Colonel Ty said Julie, a decorated military veteran and head of the history department at the Military Academy. He explained what life there was like for Davis and why the Academy is honoring him now. Colonel Benjamin Davis entered West Point in 1932. Mm -hmm. He was the only black cadet and basically he spent the next four years alone. Alone. Could Talk about the, the treatment, the silencing, um, if you will, and, and what that must have been like. Well, when he came here in 1932, uh, he came during a time when plebes were all treated poorly. So for a while, it seemed like his being treated was just part of what everyone else did. And then there was a time when he, one or two of them, of his white classmates would talk to him. And then they had a meeting of cadets. Uh, in fact, they went rapped on each door uh, and said, would you, you know, come down to the, to, the, to the bathroom and let's talk about this. So he went down there as well, and it basically said, what are we gonna do with this guy, the, in much more uh, racist language than that. And they said, we're gonna silence him, which is what cadets did to people that had violated the honor code. And they silenced him, which meant they, they wouldn't talk to him in their, except in performance of duties at any time. And he roomed alone, he had his tent alone when he was on the doing maneuvers. Uh, no one would talk to him. And it was a form of psychological uh, torture, I think. It is the best way of putting it. Silencing, it means no interaction with human beings. And he had to deal with that for four years that he was here. It's a, it's a, a level of courage uh, and of tenacity and of character that is just, it's mind boggling to me today that he was able to do that. But he also maintained a bit of a sense of humor. Um, Upon his graduation, he wrote, when my father told me of my many supporters, the many people who were pulling for me, I said, it's a pity none of them were at West Point. It is so true. It, it, there were some famous people in that class of 1936 with him. Uh, William Westmoreland, who later commanded all forces in um, Vietnam, Creighton Abrams, also a commander in Vietnam. And so there were very famous people in that class and they were all silence. They were all part of that that didn't do it. And supposedly during his graduation, he got the loudest cheer. And he says that in his autobiography, I got the loudest cheer. But that was the cheer then. It wasn't before and it wasn't afterwards. So he, was, he did have a sense of humor. He maintained that incredible dignity throughout his entire experience here and later in the Army Air Corps and in the Air Force. He was a man of extraordinary dignity that he was able to do that throughout this four year experience uh, at West Point, which he took later. He, nothing was gonna stop him from graduating from West Point, and that was what he said. And any time anybody gave him a hard time or, or was more racist to him, he would just catalog that and say, they are not gonna get me, I am going to succeed. And he graduated very high in his class. He's a brilliant man. And you brought up his, his 1991 autobiography, and I, he wrote, I was stubborn enough to put up with their treatment to reach the goal that I had come to obtain. And as you mentioned, he did obtain that. Now he was not the first black cadet to graduate from West Point. No, we had we had a, a three that graduated in the 19th century. Henry O. Flipper was the first. Um, uh, and then Charles Young was the last in 1889. But at that time then, uh, the Jim Crow laws came into being in America, where which 
sort of took away the vote from African Americans in the South and led to the poor treatment and lynching that occurred for the next 50 years and, and, and throughout American society. It wasn't just the Army. Uh, but the Army was a, was a reflection of those terrible times in America as well. And so there was one cadet that was here in 1918 for about six months. He, did, he was run out. And then Benjamin O. Davis was the next one coming in 1932. So there's almost a 50-year gap in the graduation uh, of, of an African American cadet here. And that's what makes his story so amazing is that he was able to do this at a time when when no one else in America was was saying that. And so, in fact, that, uh, you know, there was a, a terrible uh, report that came out in 1925 saying that African Americans were not, could not serve. They, they just weren't, they weren't good enough to serve. And so many um, Army officers took that as, as gospel in a way, and that led to even more racist behavior after 1925. And he really came in, in the middle of that maelstrom, uh, and yet somehow made it through. Despite everything, he stayed the course. He went on to become commander of the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Airmen, yes, that's right. He was the first black general in the Air Force? He was, is that first correct? black general in the Air Force, that's right. Talk a little bit about his career. Benjamin O. Davis, uh, when he left here, wanted to serve in the Air Corps. Uh, he wanted to fly. That was his dream. And the Army Air Corps left in no uncertain terms that he couldn't do that. And the reason that he wasn't allowed to do that is because uh, uh, African American officers were not allowed to be in command of white troops uh, of any way, shape, or form. And so that meant that he had to go in just with those units that were all black. So he went to the 24th Infantry at Fort Benning, which was the only one that would allow him to serve. And when he went down there, um, the, uh, the, the colonels of those regiments would not allow him into the house. Uh, they, he was it, it, an amazing amount of, of, of racism because the senior officers, even in the black regiments, were all white. So he wanted to fly, was not allowed to fly. And was he, I'm sorry, was he assigned as an aide to his dad? Uh, no, his dad at the time was not there. His dad, not, because as you know, his dad was the only a act, regular army colonel, black colonel in the entire army, it was the first and was an amazing soldier in his own right and would eventually become the first African American general during World War II. Uh, Benjamin O. Davis Sr., fant an amazing, amazing man in his, in his own right. Um, but, but then he served there and then when World War II started, they, there was a, a double V campaign which the double V meant that there's going to be victory against Nazis, va victory against fascism abroad, but victory against racism at home. And so the, the African American community was very strongly trying to get, make sure that there were, there were blacks flying as well. And so they started um, Tuskegee, uh, which was in the middle of Alabama. I mean, they couldn't have put it in a place that would have been more difficult for blacks to learn to fly than in this area. And yet they still overcame that. And, and learned to fly, and of course were great, great airmen. Uh, and then he took command of that organization that eventually went to Italy uh, and had a great record flying. And, and when they went to Italy, uh, they had this great record. He came back to take another command, and the, some of the senior people in the Army Air Corps said, you know, you, you shouldn't, we don't want any more black flyers because they can't do the job. And uh, both Benjamin O. Davis Sr. and Jr. Uh, reported to a commission and rebuffed that completely and said, no, we have done a great record, which they had done a supremely good record in Italy, uh, and they were continued uh, to allow to fly during that period. But, but there were uh, racist things happening to them throughout. Uh, officers clubs, uh, even though the, the president had put out that they should be desegregated, they were not during the war. So there was a n difficult, difficult things, particularly back home here. And I put one anecdote for that was that in the American South, Nazi POWs, German POWs were here and could go anywhere they wanted to. They could go on the front row of buses. They could go and serve in, uh, or not serve, they could go to movies and sit on the front row. But African Americans in the South weren't allowed to do that, even if they were in uniform. So there was this real um, hypocrisy for the American experience in the, in, in the American South uh, that Davis went a long way to combating. And as you mentioned, um, it's, you know, he's not only fighting the enemy here with his men, but he's battling these stereotypes within the, the military itself. It's absolutely true. And so he went to this commission to do that. But there's a great picture of him that shows him with, the, with his, uh, his, I think it's a, his Mustang in the back, P-51 Mustang. And he's like this, and he's got his West Point ring showing there. So, you know, here's a guy that said, I can do it. I can do it just as well as anybody else. And I did it at West Point, and I'm going to do it here in the Army Air Corps as well. And so he had, a, as a squadron commander, um, he was incredibly effective uh, as, a, as a leader, as a trainer, and in, uh, in shooting down German airplanes. He just did it all.
And he, didn't he play a key part in integrating the Air Force as well? He did. In 1948, uh, uh, President Truman issued an order desegregating all of the armed forces. Uh, but because, uh, because Davis was in the Army Air Corps during that time and then the Air Force, the Air Force did it much faster than anyone else. And he helped set the conditions to make the Air Force truly integrate much faster. So the Army, the Navy, and the Marines slow rolled it and didn't integrate. The Army integrated in 1951, three years later, but the Air Force did it immediately, and Davis was a big reason for that because he had shown in combat, which is what we in the military, you know, that's our, our most important thing. He showed that you could do that, and that he was vitally important to the desegregation efforts, not just then, but throughout his career, the example that he set is, uh, is an example for all of us. When we return more on Benjamin O. Davis's amazing story, we'll be right back.